So good evening, everyone. Uh, I guess we have 18 and growing. Um, as Sean said, my name is David Swain. I'm an immigration attorney uh, in Dallas. Uh, our firm was started in 1978. We've been doing this a very long time. Um, and coincidentally, UTD is also one of our clients. So not only do we represent uh, graduates of UTD, we also represent the university. Um, I want to mention one thing that I think is important, um, and that is that I have a tremendous amount of respect for foreign students um, for two reasons. One, uh, I would find it impossible when I was 18 years old to go to a completely different country to study something that's inherently difficult to begin with. Um, it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of determination. And uh, I, ha I have a lot of respect for, for the folks who get to do that and take advantage of that. And secondly, this pandemic, of course, has made life completely different than it used to be, although hopefully we're getting somewhat closer to normal. Um, and that's made it, I, I know, a lot more difficult for you guys as well. So um, I have a tip of my hat to everyone. Um, and I also want to remind everyone at UTD that you have one of the best international student offices in the country. I work with a lot of them, and uh, uh, UTD is, is one of, if not the best. So you're very fortunate to have those um, skills and uh, opportunities for you. So you should take advantage of them. Tonight, we're going to be discussing what happens after graduation. For those of you who have questions about before graduation, like curricular practical training or or your status itself, um, the international office will take care of that for you. Uh, so we're really only concerned about what happens after graduation. So let's go to our first slide, or our second slide, I guess, technically. And then you'll have to click, there's three of them, I believe. So everything we're gonna talk about tonight is based on employment. Uh, there are obviously other areas of immigration law, such as family, um, but we're not going to cover those tonight. This is strictly devoted to employment and getting employed in order to use the immigration system to stay in the United States, to become a permanent resident, and hopefully a U.S. citizen, if that's your goal. Um, if you don't have a job or can't get a job, then we're not going to have any options. So I'm kind of combining the issue of getting employment along with using the immigration system at the same time. So if that's not what you're here for, it's going to be a little boring. Um, fortunately, the one good thing about uh, virtual seminars is you can leave and you don't have to get up and walk out. So uh, you can just leave, but hopefully you'll stay. OK, so we're going to talk about these three categories um, and most importantly, how to get a job, find jobs and get them so that we can move forward in the process. Uh, so Sean, next slide, please. Right now, all of you or almost all of you are what we call non-immigrants. And non-immigrant is a fancy phrase for temporary. And each of those little letters and numbers like E1, F1, H1, those all stand for sections of the Immigration and Nationality Act. So F1 student doesn't really mean F for foreign student. It means that's the section of the Immigration Act that applies to students. Um, in addition to being temporary, each of these things allows you to do only what that category allows. So for students, for example, you're not authorized to be employed other than uh, CPT or OPT um, unless you change your status. So if we change our status, then we go from one non-immigrant category to another non-immigrant category. And the thing we're going to talk about tonight is F1 to H1, which is loosely called professional workers. So the next slide, please. Ultimately, we want to make you an immigrant, which is a fancy word for permanent. So non-immigrant is temporary. Immigrant is permanent. So people who are not involved in the immigration process call everybody immigrants. Uh, but actually, you guys right now are non-immigrants, and we want to make you an immigrant whenever we can. And if you look towards the middle, there are three employment-based immigrant categories, first preference, second, and third. And we're going to, going to primarily 
discuss second preference and third preference. For those of you who are going to go on to be a postdoc, uh, go into research or become university faculty, uh, most of your options are going to be in first preference and second preference. I'm not specifically going to address those this evening. I will be happy to answer questions or uh, all of you should have access to my email address. And if you want to email me, please do. It's free. We don't charge anything. I'm more than happy to help you uh, as long as you don't ask questions like, how do I get a green card? Because I don't type that fast. But if you have specific questions, I'll be happy to do that. Just tell me that you uh, attended the seminar and that you're a UTD student, and I'll be happy to take care of it. Uh, but if you have questions tonight, we'll address those as well. Next slide. Okay, these are the four ways that F1 students can work. Uh, you probably all know these. The only one we're going to be talking about tonight is optional practical training as post completion, which means after you've completed your degree. So, next slide. So, go ahead, you can. I think there's four of them. So everyone who graduates with a degree gets at least one year of practical training, unless you had practical training at the same degree level previously, which also means that you get another year of practical training if you get a higher degree. So you could have practical training after your bachelor's, after your master's and your PhD, but you cannot get another year if you go from one master's to another. Um, some degrees, which are called STEM degrees in science, technology, engineering, and math, may qualify for an extra two years. That's called the STEM extension. So if you have a degree in one of those areas, you can get a total of three years of practical training. Um, one of the difficult things about the first year is that you cannot have 90 days of unemployment during that year. If you do, you go out of status. Um, one way around this, uh, to alleviate the penalty with, of going out of status is if you cannot find an employer, you can volunteer in an internship for any employer that's related to your degree. Okay, so nobody should have 91 days or more of unemployment because all you have to do is volunteer at least 20 hours a week and you are not considered to be unemployed. This is very important. It's explained. Um, more clearly in our written materials, but just keep in mind that you cannot have more than 90 days of unemployment and volunteering as a trainee or as an internship, it can't be a real job. You can't take a job from someone or work in a job that would normally be paid. It has to be an unpaid internship. So take advantage of that if you have difficulty finding an employer. Um, I've heard students say that they have 90 days after graduation to find a job, and that's simply not true. Look at it this way. Let's say you graduate and you're having difficulty finding an employer, but you find one on the 90th day. You haven't volunteered. You just have been unemployed. Well, that's fine, except what happens six months later if the company cuts back on their staff and they let the intern go? The next day would be your 91st day of unemployment and you would be out of status. So don't wait 90 days. If you're having trouble after you graduate, immediately go into a volunteer situation. And I, I can guarantee you there are lots of employers that would love to have a UTD graduate working without being paid until you can, of course, find a paying job. And by the way, a lot of students have found employment this way. Because they do such a good job, the company they're volunteering for makes them a job offer. So this is a really, really important uh, issue that you need to take care of. And note number four, that if there is any violation of all these rules about uh, OPT, you go out of status, you're subject to deportation and being barred from coming back. So this is very serious. And the Immigration Service is getting very, very strict about this. There are lots of students who have missed out on the opportunity to change status to H1 because they made a mistake or didn't do something properly while in OPT, like the address change or the change of employer. So get these rules. The International Office has them. Our written materials have them. 
you must learn them and you must follow them exactly or we're going to have trouble down the uh, down the road okay next slide this is the information um, about the stem extension i'm not going to go through all of it because it doesn't apply to everyone but if you are in a stem degree or will have a stem degree make sure that you pay attention to these rules uh, probably the biggest student problem we have had for the last, I want to say, five years is students who failed to properly apply for the STEM extension and were denied. Um, if you follow the rules, it should be fine. If you don't follow the rules, the Immigration Service has a zero tolerance. They will deny the case and they won't let you get around it. We have even been to federal court in some of these cases and have lost. So uh, the way to avoid it is to make sure that you follow all the rules when you apply for it. And the international office will help you do that. But some of it you must do yourself. OK, so uh, at this point, if anyone has questions about OPT, the STEM extension uh, or student employment, this is the time to ask. Let's see, would minors in STEM qualify for this? Sure. Uh, oh, you mean, my, I, I'm sorry, I took that to mean age. Um, if you mean the minor as opposed to the major, no, it has to be the major in order to qualify for OPT to begin with and the STEM extension. Anyone else? I hope everyone's an uh, OPT expert now. Okay. Sean, I guess we can go ahead with the next slide. Yeah, it looks like there might be a couple of chats. Okay. Ah, that were sent in privately. That's why they're not showing up for you. Um, so let me ask these for the students. Um, one question is for a postdoc, which one is more suitable? OPT, J1, question mark. I'm an F1 student now. Well, the J-1 is almost never recommended because most of them have what's called a two-year foreign residency requirement, which means that once you complete the employment, you have to go home for two years or get a waiver, and the waivers are extremely difficult to get. So my short answer is OPT is your best option. Great. Uh, we have another question. If we are in the beginning of our OPT, but get the H-1B visa instead, is the OPT canceled? Yes, you would change status from F1 to H1 and no longer have OPT. And you can't recapture it later. You can't switch back to F1 status and regain the OPT that you didn't use. Once you change status, the OPT is gone. Now, if you go back and get a higher degree, if you change status to F1 and then get a master's degree, then you get another year of OPT and a STEM extension if you qualify. But once you change status to H1, that's all gone. Great. It looks like there's one more question. Um, the question is, for applying to STEM OPT, can I apply as early as 90 days before the initial OPT ends? Yes, and we highly encourage you to do so. It takes at least three months to get the EAD card, which is the OPT. And one of the worst things that students do is they wait till the right before graduation to apply because they think that will extend the time they have to find a job. But that's not really the issue. The issue is if you don't have your EAD and you graduate and you get a job offer, the company is not going to wait three or four months to employ you. So I encourage everyone, regardless of what country you're from, what area you're in, what industry, file 90 days before graduation and get the EAD as soon as you can so that you can take advantage of any job offers that you get as soon as possible. Great. Looks like one more question came in. And okay. for our group of students here, I will ask if you want to type your question into the group chat or the Q&A section, um, that'll allow Mr. Swain to see them as well, which could be helpful. Um, so one more question. Some tech companies directly apply for employers H-1B even when they are on OPT. Is this true information? If yes, what are pros and cons? Uh, yes, they do, and there are no cons, only pros. The 
The H1, as we're about to discuss, is based on a lottery. And if you only get one year of OPT, you only get one chance to apply for the lottery. If you have a STEM extension, you get three chances and you may need all three before you get selected in the lottery. So you need to apply every opportunity you get for the H1 lottery so that you get selected. That there is no negative to applying every time you can for the H1. Great. Is that everybody? It looks like two more questions came in. Okay. I'll just share with the group that we're about to talk about H1B. Um, it looks like these are a little different. One question is, can you go to school while on H1B? Uh, yes, part-time. Um, technically, the Immigration Services regulations say that you cannot be in a degree program, um, which also means you cannot be full-time. But I have seen many, many students who are in H1 status who actually graduate with another degree, uh, a higher degree or maybe a degree in a different field. Um, so yes, you can do that. Uh, it varies from school to school, so you need to check with the school to make sure what their rules are. Great. We have another question here. Uh, during the postdoc using OPT, can I apply for H-1B? I think we answered that. Yes, you can. Yes. As a, uh, a PhD student, you can actually apply after you complete the coursework. You don't even have to complete the thesis. Same thing is true for master's degrees. Right. And it looks like another one just came in. Uh, the question is, we are responsible for lottery application or the company will intimate us on the application deadlines? Um, everything regarding the H-1 is sponsored by the employer. So the registration for the lottery, the H-1 petition itself, those are all technically performed by uh, the company, although actually we do it, or attorneys do it for the company. But you're not really applying for anything um, other than a change of status, but that, that's not even something that you have to sign. Is that everyone? Uh, one more popped in. So okay. I'll maybe say that we'll answer this one and then move on. Um, this question is, does my company need to have an immigration attorney to complete the H-1B process? Is it possible to do it with an immigration attorney? Uh, you are not required, the company is not required to have an immigration attorney. But uh, for the last 15 years or so, it's become so complicated that it's extremely difficult to do it without a qualified immigration attorney. Um, so you don't have to do it. Uh, but the last few years, the only time I've seen a company try to do it themselves, it became a huge mess, uh, some of which we can fix and some of which we cannot. So, uh, yes, you probably will have and should have an attorney. Now, one thing that I've seen a lot lately, especially with uh, contractors, if the company has an immigration attorney who's not uh, in the company, what we call in-house, it's an outside attorney like myself that the company hires to represent them. That attorney also represents the student. This is really important because some companies try to tell the students that that's our attorney, not your attorney. That is not true. It is very clear that in employment immigration, the attorney represents both the employer and the employee. And that attorney has responsibilities to the student, one of which is giving you information. So if the company ever tells you that it's not your attorney, that is simply not true. And I love to discuss this issue with those attorneys uh, because what they're doing is, is not only improper, uh, but it can be very damaging to the student status. So keep that in mind if you have a company, a so-called company attorney. Okay, let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about employment. Looks like this. I guess there's one. There we go. Okay, so okay. let's go for the first one. So let's assume that you own a company in the U.S. and you're a U.S. citizen and you go to interviews on campus or your recruiter goes to interviews on campus and you have two applicants. 
One of them is an F-1 student, one of them is a U.S. citizen. Both of them have identical backgrounds, same GPA, same major, sort of the same life experiences, although obviously somewhat different. So they're really equal. As the owner of the company, which one would you hire if they're both equal? And most, since we don't have a show of hands today, um, what most people say is they would hire the U.S. citizen. And why? That's number two. Here we get the next one. There. The reasons not to hire an F-1 student is it's expensive. It makes more work for the company. And using a legal phrase, it's a hassle. If companies don't like it. it. It's just, it's messy. Even if they have an attorney, which they will, uh, representing, they still have to do extra work and they have to pay for part of it. So that's why most people say they would hire the U.S. citizen. But I'm going to prove to you tonight that that is wrong. And the reason it's wrong, it's not very sexy. It's not, it doesn't appear to be very important, but it is critical to companies. So number three, the reason primarily to hire an F-1 student rather than the U.S. citizen is retention. The number one problem that human resource managers complain about and have complained about for more than 30 years is retaining qualified employees. But what they don't like doing is hiring someone out of college and training them for a year or two, and then the employee leaves and goes to a competitor. They obviously don't want that to happen, but it's very difficult to stop. As a matter of fact, it's impossible for a company to stop a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident. But you guys are about to find out that you're going to have to find an employer who will sponsor you. And to get a green card, you're going to be with that company for a minimum of five and on average seven years. The average American citizen who graduates from college will leave their first employer within 22 months. Okay? So the company trains them, they give them experience, and in less than two years, they're gone. You, however, as an F-1 student, are going to be there for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years even in some cases. So if you own the company and you want qualified employees, it is much better to hire foreign students and go through the immigration process than it is to hire a U.S. citizen. Now, obviously, there's many other reasons why U.S. citizens would be preferred over F-1 students, but you have to emphasize this with potential employers. As a matter of fact, in our written materials, there's a one-page summary that explains to potential companies why it is best, or at least better, to hire foreign, foreign students and going through the immigration process. If you go to interviews or you interview online with a company, you need to be able to explain this so everything we're going to talk about from this point on is going to give you the ammunition you need to convince employers to give you a job offer. Okay, let's go to the next one. Obviously, if your green card process is going to take at least five years and more likely seven or eight years, we have a problem because your OPT at most is going to last three years if you're a STEM uh, graduate. So in most cases, not all, but in most cases, we have to bridge this gap between the OPT and the green card. And that's the reason that in most cases, we file for a change of status to H-1. The H-1 gives us an additional six years of employment, and it can also be unlimited if the employee is in the green card process. So if you get to the end of the six years and you don't have your green card yet, which happens to many natives of China and India because the green card process is so long, the H-1 will protect them, allow them to stay and work until the green card is finished. So what is an H-1? Essentially, it's very simple. The employee has to have at least a bachelor's degree in a technical or professional field. And what that means is it won't work for degrees in fine arts or liberal arts in general or general business degrees without a concentration. Everything else should work. 
Uh, fine arts graduates can get an H-1 if they teach, but not um, if the job just uh, is in the fine arts, like a musician or an artist, because those jobs don't require bachelor's degrees, but teaching does. Um, so if you're getting a fine arts degree or a liberal arts degree, you may want to talk to me or someone else about uh, your opportunities after you graduate and maybe make some changes before them. Um, the H-1 initially is granted for three years. You can get a three-year extension. Uh, you cannot go beyond six years unless you are actively in the green card process. Um, the other advantage to the H-1 as opposed to OPT is if you want to travel, it's often very difficult, if not impossible, to get another F-1 visa. Because to get an F-1 visa, you have to prove the intent to go home and you've already graduated and now you're working for a U.S. company, so it looks like you're not going to go home. The H-1 has none of that intent requirement. So changing status to the H-1 also gives you a better way of getting a visa to travel. And by the way, if you're not traveling, you don't need a visa. Visas are irrelevant if you're in the United States. They are only good for travel. So if you never travel, you never need a visa. But if you do travel, you'll have to go to the U.S. consulate to get one. And it's highly likely that you'll get an H-1 as opposed to an F-1. Um, and, and I'll just make a short comment about this because it's much more complicated than we have time to address. But in some cases, the employee will be able to go through the immigration process within the three years, including the STEM extension. This will not work for natives of China uh, or India because the process takes much longer than three years, but it may work for people from other countries. But it's very complicated and it's, it's tricky because you have to have what's called qualifying experience which means you have to get the experience and go through the green card process all within three years. So some people can take advantage of that, but most of you are going to need to change status to the H-1. The next slide is going to show us some problems with the H-1. So Sean, we can put all of those up. Uh, one of the things that immediately is a problem for employers when they decide to go through the immigration process is that the H-1 requires the employer to pay a $2,000 filing fee or $1,250 if there's less than 25 employees. And companies don't like that. They obviously don't have to pay anything to hire a U.S. citizen. So, you know, why do I have to pay to hire an F-1 student? Well, the law requires it. The company has to pay it. You cannot pay it. You cannot reimburse them. But to fully understand the $2,000 filing fee for employers, let's look at the big picture. Let's say that you're gonna be working at this company for the average of seven years, which most people do, or more. And let's say you make $50,000 a year. You'll make more than that, but I'm not good at math, so we'll keep it simple. So over those seven years, you're gonna be paid $350,000 you're actually going to be paid much more than that because you've got FICA or Social Security, the company has to pay uh, health insurance. There's a lot of other things that cost companies to hire someone and keep them employed. So my point to employers, and most, if not all of them, agree with this, if they're going to spend four hundred dollars or $450,000 over seven years for your employment, what difference does it make if it's $452,000. It's really meaningless. So that fee doesn't really matter as long as you're with the company until you get your green card. Now, if you decide to leave the company after a year or two, the company may be upset about that, although there's nothing they can really do about it. But if you stay there through the green card, that employer's fee is meaningless. The big problem with H1s that we've already talked about a little bit is that it's a lottery. Each year on October 1st, the government gives the Immigration Service 85,000 H-1s. There's uh, 65,000 for bachelor's degree and higher degrees, and 20,000 reserved for master's and higher. So there's a statistical advantage if you have a master's degree from the U.S. 
or a PhD from the US. It's not a really big advantage, but it, there is an advantage. Um, but everybody goes into the lottery. It's a completely blind lottery. It makes no difference who the company is, who the attorney is, what your degree is in, how much money you make, uh, which was a proposal last year by immigration that's not in force. Um, it's completely blind. So you could put a mouse in a FedEx package and get selected in the lottery. They have no idea what's in those packages. So, which is good, but it also means it's a lottery. Last year, I believe there were 122,000 petitions for the 85,000 H1s. So those are the odds of getting it with a slight advantage to master degree holders. Um, we start the H1 process with what's called registration. As a matter of fact, it starts today and runs through the end of March. During that time, we file a very, very limited amount of information to the immigration service to see if we can be selected in the lottery, which is good because until two years ago, we had to fire the, file the entire H-1 package, which is a lot of work and money that was just wasted if you weren't selected in the lottery. Now we just have to register. If you're selected in the lottery because of the registration, you have 60 days or the company has 60 days to file the H-1 petition and change of status. Once that's filed, you should have a decision from the Immigration Service before October 1st telling you that your status has been changed and your H-1 petition has been approved and it becomes effective on October 1. The important thing about October 1 is that you have to be in status on October 1. So in other words, if you register for the lottery and you're selected, but your status is going to expire before October 1st, you cannot change your status. All you will get is an approved petition that you have to take to the U.S. Consulate and get an H-1 visa to come back and get H-1 status. So remember the October 1st date. It's very important. Um, Sean, let's go to the next slide. This is a chart for uh, people who graduate in May and only have one year of OPT. So what this means is that your OPT is gonna start in May but the registration period has already ended back in March. So you're not gonna be able to try registration until the following March, the next year. And your OPT is going to expire in May of that year. So you will not be in status on October 1st. What the law allows though for May graduates only is that you get an automatic extension of your one year OPT if you're selected in the lottery and your H1 is approved. So your OPT actually extends from May until October 1, and then your change of status takes effect. Next slide, please. If you graduate in August, your OPT is gonna run from August or September until the following August or September. And you're gonna to have to register in March, which gives you only about six or seven months to find an employer that will sponsor you for the H1. If you graduate in May, you have almost a year, actually about nine months or 10 months to find an employer. So it's a limit, it's a little bit limited um, for people who graduate in August, you have less time to find an employer. However, your OPT is going to end in August or September and you're gonna be in the 60 day grace period without the ability to work until October 1. So all of these things have to be taken into consideration in terms of when you're going to graduate. Next slide, please. The worst situation from an immigration perspective is graduating in December. If you graduate in December and all you have is one year of OPT, the only time you can register for the H-1 is two or three months after graduation in March. So you've only, if you don't have an employer at graduation, you've only got two or three months to find an employer that will sponsor you. And then you have to register that March and if selected in the lottery, great, you can go ahead and file the H-1. But if you're not selected in the lottery, that means at the end of your OPT, you'll have no way of changing your status unless you go back into another degree program. 
Okay, so if you plan on graduating in a December, you might want to reconsider that and extend your coursework until May, which is the best time to graduate. So let's talk about the H1 and uh, these OPT restrictions if you only have one year. So I see a couple. Uh, so the question is, what if I start working after my master's and wanted to pursue an MBA from my dream school? What will be the changes and impact without risking being out of the US? I'm not sure I understand the question unless you mean two masters, like you have a master's in one area and then you want to pursue an MBA, you would just simply pursue the MBA, but you will not have any OPT after the MBA if you use the one year of OPT after the master's. So that's something to consider if I understand the question correctly. Uh, the next question is I'm graduating in May 2021. If an employer hires me now, with joining after grad hires me now with joining after graduation, can the employer apply for the H1 under their master's cap? And uh, the short answer is yes, um, because technically you'll have the master's degree in Oct on October 1st is when you have to qualify for it. Um, it's much better if you've completed all of your coursework by March. Um, because that's all that's really required for OPT, um, even though the master's degree itself would be required for the H1. If you haven't completed your coursework by March and you're gonna graduate in May, that could be difficult to, con to convince the immigration service that you would fall under the master's cap, but I would certainly try it. That's how I would file. If they disagree, then you would just fall into the 65,000, um, which as I said, isn't that much different than the master's uh, cap anyway. Any other questions? I believe there's seven questions. Uh, I do see a few oh, additional okay. questions. I, see them. I was actually started at the bottom. Um, the question is, is it possible to apply for a green card during the first two years of H-1B? And the answer to that is yes, as long as you have qualifying experience, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, next question, I'm planning to apply for OPT, but not sure if we'll be able to finish PhD thesis by then. Uh, can I finish the thesis while on OPT? And the answer is yes. For master's and PhD degrees, you only have to finish the coursework to get OPT. You do not have to finish the thesis and have the uh, degree in your hand. Um, can we also sponsor ourselves for H1 or only an employer can do that? Only an employer can do that. Only employers can file for H-1s. However, you can create a partnership or a corporation that you own, and that corporation or partnership can file the H-1 for you. But I want to caution everyone. This is a, uh, an area that's become extremely popular in the last few years. But there's a real problem with this that has to be planned for. And there are ways to plan for it, but it's very complicated. The problem is, that although a company you own can file an H-1, a company you own cannot file a labor certification for a green card. So you cannot get permanent residence through that company. There are ways around this, but as I said, they're complicated and they have to be looked at at the very beginning before you create the corporation or the partnership. So do not go off and start your company without talking to an immigration attorney and a business attorney. Uh, let's see, let me find the next one. Um, are we responsible for lottery application or company? I think we already answered that one. The company will do that. The company handles almost everything in the immigration process based on employment. I think that's all the new questions. Sean, do you have any? Yes, it looks like there were a couple submitted privately. Uh, one question is, can you summarize what documents I should have to send to an immigration lawyer if my H-1B lottery is picked to send to USCIS? Um, primarily, you're going to need your immigration documents, which are your passport, 
uh, with the visa, your I-20, um, your EAD card with your OPT, your diploma, and your transcripts. If you have dependents, you would also need a marriage license and birth certificates for children. So that's really all that's required for the student employee. Uh, most, about 95% of the documents come from the employer. Uh, we have another question. It says, I am a December graduate and about to start my OPT, which hasn't started yet because of USCIS delays. I know you said this is the worst option to graduate. My OPT will end next year in March or April 2022. Will I be eligible then for the H-1B lottery in March 2022? If I apply this year and don't get selected, I can apply next year as well, correct? I am non-STEM. Non-STEM, well, uh, yes, you can, but you would have to go into another degree program in the spring of next year so that you'll be in status on March or in March. Um, there's a slight chance that uh, your grace period, the 60-day grace period would cover March, but it won't cover October 1st. So the short answer is yes, but you'll have to enroll in a new degree program with a new I-20 to stay in status. And then it looks like there's two more questions. One is, my sister is a U.S. citizen. How can that help me? Uh, it really can't. And the reason is um, the employment categories and the family categories depend on quotas. Each country has their own quota. And every country in the world uh, has a quota for siblings, which is called FB4. And FB4 is backlogged at least 10 years. Um, if you're a native of Mexico, it's more like 20. Uh, so uh, you, your sister can certainly file the petition for you and get the 10 year clock started, but it won't benefit you at all until it becomes current 10 years later or 12 years later. So you have to remain in status that whole time. And the only way you can stay in status is through employment. And since you can get employment, permanent residence, except for natives of India, much faster than 10 years, uh, there's really no reason to rely on your sister, unfortunately. Right. And it looks like there's a few more questions that came into the general Q&A. Oh, I see. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, can I join another company and ensure that my H1 will be filed for fiscal year 2022? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand the other company. Um, you can have as many companies as you want file for registration. Uh, you, you can't file multiple times for one company, but you can file one time for multiple companies. Um, so I'm not sure you might want to clarify that if I'm not addressing your question correctly. Um, one is what are the reasons why I would want to begin OPT before graduation? And the answer is there's no reason. Any time that you use OPT before graduation is deducted from your post-completion OPT. And there's absolutely no reason to do that because before graduation, you can get what's called CPT or curricular practical training. And that is not deducted from your post-graduate um, or post-completion OPT unless you work on CPT full-time for more than 12 months. If you do that, you don't get any OPT after graduation. But you could, for example, you could work part-time as much as you want and still get your full OPT after graduation. Or you could work full-time on OPT, I'm sorry, CPT, for 11 months and two weeks and still get your OPT. But if you work full-time for 12 months or more of CPT, you get no OPT after graduation. So OPT before graduation is a very bad idea. Um, let's see. What would my, if I married during post-completion OPT, whoops, I lost it. Uh, what visa would my spouse get? Well, your spouse wouldn't get a visa, but she would get status. Um, and the spouse of an H1 would be in what we call H4 status. 
uh, she does not have authorization or he does not have authorization to work uh, until you get through the second step of the green card. And then he or she would be able to get work authorization. Uh, okay, here's, uh, I did master's in engineering. I'm currently on OPT, it started in June, 2020. And they are, your company's gonna be registering um, and you have an offer from another company, well, that's a decision you're going to have to make. Um, first of all, you'd have to find out if the second company is willing to register this time for the H-1. Um, and if they're not willing to do that, I definitely would stay with your current employer. Uh, so you need a little bit more information to make that decision. But I think ultimately that's going to be a, a professional decision about your career more than an immigration because you can do either one. Uh, can I join another company when my current company applies for the H-1B this time? Uh, well, you can, but if you get selected in the lottery and you go to that other company, um, you won't be able to change status to H-1 unless that company is selected also. Uh, I think we've addressed most of these. Oh, yeah, we've answered that one. Sean, I think I've answered. All right, I think oh. there's. Unless there's some private ones. Yeah, there were two more sent in the private chat. Uh, one question is, is there a lottery or provision where our company can apply for H-1B with no cap gap limit? Uh, not an 85,000, like working in the university or state agency? Well, there, there's only two exceptions to the 85,000. One is a university or an employer that's related to a university, um, like a medical school. Um, or it can be a nonprofit, but this is the part that many people don't realize. It has to be a nonprofit where you would be employed in research. It's not just any nonprofit. It's only nonprofits that require research or they have a division that does research and you would be in that division doing research based on your degree. Otherwise, every other employer is subject to the cap. And the last question from the private chat is, if as a holder of an H-1B visa, you decide to start a PhD, do you lose the H-1B status? No, you can attend school part time while you're in H-1 status. Um, and some uh, universities will even allow you to go full time, but you have to maintain your H-1 status. Um, for example, if your H-1 is based on full time employment and you only want to work part time, you have to change the H-1. A new H-1 petition has to be filed to go from full time to part time, and then you could have more time to, to work on the PhD. Um, but you can certainly go to school uh, and stay in H1 status at the same time. Great, thank you. I think that's all of our questions for right now. Okay, great. Let's go to the next, actually the next second slide. I think there's another divider, yeah. Okay, for the, the rest of this, what we're gonna be talking about is permanent residence, how to get a green card through your employer. So we have to assume one of two things, either you have H-1 status and we're selected in the lottery, or you are not selected in the lottery. And even though you're a STEM graduate, uh, you weren't selected the three times you can apply. In which case, if you're not selected in the lottery, the only way you can stay and work in the US is go to a university, enroll in a graduate program, and the university agrees in advance to give you what we call upfront CPT. In other words, you're gonna be enrolled in a degree plan and you're gonna get curricular practical training the first day of that program, which allows you to work full-time for your current company. It doesn't matter where the school is, it can be in Washington or Mississippi or wherever, 
Yeah, because you're not going to be attending classes except maybe one online course, uh, depending on what the school requires. So if you're not selected in the lottery, there's still a way, although it's very complicated, there's still a way for you to work and then try the registration for the H-1 lottery the next year or even the year after that. Some CPTs can be expended, extended for 18 months, which would cover two registrations. So we're gonna, going to assume that you have one of those two things and we're gonna start the green card process. Um, in order to go through this and have it make some sense, I need to create a little fact scenario. And you can take your degree and the industry you wanna work in and plug it into my facts and it's, it's going to be exactly the same process. So just read into my story, what your story is, and it will be the same result. So let's say I'm going to graduate from UTD with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. I'm not even sure if that still exists, but let's just keep this simple. So you have a bachelor's in electrical engineering. You get a job from a company. You have your OPT. You're going to be eligible for the STEM OPT. And at some point in that three years, you get selected for the H-1 or you go into that upfront CPT I mentioned. So we want to figure out how's the best way to apply for the green card. First, first thing we have to do is go back to those categories I mentioned at the very beginning. And tonight we're going to be talking about second preference and third preference. Second preference is any job that requires a master's degree or higher and you have that degree. It can be from the US or it can be an equivalent degree from outside the US. Third preference is basically every job that requires a bachelor's degree. So second preference is master's, third preference is bachelor's. Keep in mind, if you have a master's degree, but the job with that employer only requires a bachelor's, that is third preference, not second preference, because the job must require the master's. Okay, so in my case, in my fact scenario, I have a UTD bachelor's degree, so we know that my case is going to be in third preference, and we'll come back to that in just a minute. Next slide, please. The three steps to green cards through employers is first, a labor certification, which is sometimes erroneously called PERM. The, the accurate way to say it is labor certification. The second step, and I'm sorry, that is a process with the uh, U.S. Department of Labor. The I-140 petition is the second step, and that's processed with the Immigration Service. The third and final step is called adjustment of status, and this is the only time in the process when you as an individual are applying for something. The two steps preceding this in the green card process are, are performed by the employer or their attorney, more likely. And the H-1 and the processes before that are also handled by the employer. But the third step in the green card adjustment of status is actually filed by you and your dependents if you have any. Next slide, please. So what is a labor certification? The top number one uh, bullet point is what the law actually states. It's what the Immigration Act says. The employer has to prove to the Department of Labor that there are no qualified and available U.S. workers for the job. And there's a very special way that we have to do that. If you follow the Department of Labor's rules exactly, you have a very good chance of winning these cases. As a matter of fact, our firm has about a 95% approval rating on labor certifications. And I think nationwide, it's about 85 to 90 percent um, uh, for all companies combined. So if it's done correctly, you have a very good chance of being successful, even though it sounds difficult. The first thing we do to prove this issue to the Department of Labor is we have to figure out what the minimum qualifications are for the job in terms of education and experience. Those are the only two things that are considered. We're not allowed to consider if the person uh, is well dressed or behaves well or any of those subjective things. We can only consider education and experience. So once we have that figured out, we're going to go to the third step and actually go through the process of proving there is no qualified and available U.S. worker. 
Now let's take my situation. I have a bachelor's degree and the job that I entered into was an entry level job, obviously, because when I was hired, I didn't have any experience. I only had a degree. So we know from those facts that my job requires a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and no experience. If we take that and go out and, and process number three, where we recruit US workers and they apply for the job, we're gonna have thousands of qualified people. Everybody that I just graduated with is qualified for the job because it only requires a degree. So we don't file cases on entry level jobs. That's an automatic way to lose a lot of labor certification. What we do is we wait until you acquire, acquire experience with that company. And then we want a job offer, a higher job offer that requires that experience. So again, using a very simple example, let's say that I started with my company as an engineer one, which is an entry level bachelor's degree only. After I work for two or three years, the next higher job is called an engineer two, and it requires two years of experience. Okay, so if we then go out and process number three and recruit US workers, the job requires a bachelor's and double E and two years of engineering experience. But if you think about it, that won't work either because there are hundreds or thousands of people who have degrees in double E and have engineering experience. So that won't work. But that's also not really the way companies work. What they really do, and this is kind of the secret of labor certifications, companies specialize. Either they specialize within their company or the company itself specializes in one thing. For example, we have had a client for many years which requires degrees in civil engineering and two years of experience with foundations for car dealerships, for automobile dealerships. And the reason this engineering company does this is because car dealerships, as you know, have hundreds of cars out on their lot. And what they don't want is cracked cement. So people are walking around looking at cars and the cement's cracked everywhere. It makes the cars look bad. So they hire specialized engineering companies like our client who go in and they do everything they can to make sure that there's no cracks in the cement. It sounds like a minor thing, but it's extremely important to the dealership. So when we recruit for that engineering firm, all of our requirements state that you have to have a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and two years of experience with foundations of automobile dealerships. And obviously there are very, very few people in the country that have that kind of experience. As a matter of fact, it's probably just that one engineering firm. So those cases are very easy and it's kind of an extreme example, but that's our goal. Most jobs have anywhere from two or three to 10 or more specific skill sets that they require. It could be a certain type of software. It could be government regulations. Um, uh, for example, if you're a CPA, the company may specialize in oil and gas tax, which not every CPA individual can do that or has experience in that. So the point is that over time, you're going to accrue experience, which is specialized. And then we want a job offer from the same company that requires that experience. And let's say you have, for example, 10 skill sets that are required. The U.S. workers who apply must meet all 10. If they only meet nine, they are not qualified. If they meet eight, they are not qualified. They have to meet every single one. And of course you meet every single one because you were in the job for at least two years where you acquired that experience. So this is really important. This is the key to every green card case through employment. So the, the question is often, when can I start my green card with my employer? And the answer is, once you have experience that's specialized and you have a job offer that requires that experience. So that might be two years, it may be five years, depending on the company. So that's one question that you can ask the company if they select you for an H1, for example, you can say, you know, what are the requirements for my job currently, which will probably just be entry level, but what are the requirements for my next job? If I get promoted, 
What does that job require? And that's going to tell you your chances for getting permanent resident. Okay, uh, Sean, can we go back to the uh, previous slide? Okay, so that's the labor certification process, which currently takes about a year to complete, sometimes eight to 10 months, sometimes 12 months. And at the end of that, we can go immediately to the second step. And in some cases, we can go to the second and third steps. And this is a little bit complicated. It's hard to do virtually because I could hand out the actual visa bulletins and you could see them. But in order to file the second step, all we need is the employer's ability to pay your salary. That's really all the second step is about. And we would have already addressed that when we started the case anyway, because we don't want to go through the labor certification and then find out the company's going broke because we won't be able to complete the case. So we would have already determined that and, and obtained the documentation to prove it. To go to the third step, we have to rely on a quota. And that's why the second preference and third preference category is so important. There's a lot fewer people applying for second preference because there's fewer people that have master's degrees or jobs that require master's degrees. So the quota for the second preference is usually faster than third preference where there's a lot more people who have bachelor's degrees. Unfortunately for India and China, there's so many people that have applied in both categories because they have a master's degree and the job requires a master's degree that the third preference is actually slower than second preference. I'm sorry, faster than second preference. So natives of India and China need to be really careful how they plan this out as to when they can file the third step. Those of you who are, who are not born in China or India can file steps two and three at the same time, as long as it's second preference. If it's third preference, it's probably going to have a delay of one to three years. Right now, it's actually current. So you could file steps two and three together in third preference. But normally, in normal times, third preference is backlog one to three years. So you would have to wait that long to file the third step. Second preference is almost always current for any country except India or China. So you can file steps two and three together. That process is going to take another year to 18 months. We can use premium processing for the I-140 petition, but that's really a waste of money because it's not gonna make the adjustment of status any faster. The only reason to use premium processing on the I-140 is because once it's approved, your H-4 spouse would then be eligible for work authorization. Um, but if your second preference and you get to file steps two and three together, there's no reason to use premium processing because your spouse is gonna get an EAD through the adjustment of status in about six months. So there's lots of options when you get to the, uh, the point where you have the labor certification approved, there's lots of strategies that go into that. Okay, so that's how we get permanent residents through employment. So let's start with the questions on that. I think, I, yeah, the last question I had was, ah, uh, here we go. Okay, if my job description requires a bachelor's and five years experience, but master's would be preferred, can I apply in the EB2 category? And the answer is no. The reason is because the job must require a master's. Now it could require an alternative bachelor's in five years, that's fine but the master's cannot be preferred. It has to be required in order to be second preference. So that case would be third preference. So what you need the company to say is this job requires a master's and because of the Department of Labor system, it's actually a master's in two years of experience or a bachelor's in five. If that's the way it's stated, that would be second preference. But if the master's preferred, it would be third preference. Um, Next question is, can we go back to our home country during first year of uh, OPT? And the answer is maybe, but we advise against it. Uh, first, if you would have to apply for a new visa because your visa is expired, you certainly should not go because it would be very difficult 
to get an F-1 visa at the U.S. consulate because you have that temporary intent requirement that's difficult to meet after you've graduated. If your visa is current, then it would be much easier for you to travel and come back because you don't have to go to the consulate. But you still might have problems at the port of entry because, again, you've graduated and you're working and it looks like you intend to stay, and that's a violation of the F-1. So we prefer that students do not travel during OPT. We want to get your H-1 as soon as possible, and then you can travel. Uh, I think I saw one pop up. Uh, when I start my OPT, let's say July 1st, what is a good time to let the employer know to initiate H-1 sponsorship? Well, they can't initiate the sponsorship except in March of each year unless you work for a capped exempt employer. So you should have already found out whether they're gonna sponsor you for the H-1, but you won't be able to do it in, under these facts until March of 2022. That's when you would register. And if you're selected, then you would apply for the H-1 petition. Uh, Sean, I don't see any new ones. Yeah, there's one more that came in privately. Uh, okay. The question is, you already talked about this a little, but can you explain the petition process? If I get H-1B with an employer in 2021 and want to switch employers in 2022 or 23, am I not able to do so? Yes, you can change employers, but uh, you don't have to go through the cap again. So the lottery is not an issue, but you have to repeat the entire H-1 process. So a new petition, uh, with all the things that the petition requires. Instead of a change of status, you would be applying for an extension of status, but it's essentially the exactly the same process that you went through the first time, except no lottery. And I see one more private question came in. Uh, it reads, if I get selected for OPT and don't choose premium processing, so I technically get the authorization in October, 2021, can I still work remotely from a different country? Um, well, there's no premium processing for OPT. So I, I'm not sure about that question. Um, if you've applied for OPT, you just simply want to wait until it becomes available. And if you've been approved for the change of status to H1, that would take uh, effect on October 1st. So there wouldn't be any reason to leave the country if I understand the question correctly. They added a clarification. Um, I think it was a typo they meant for H-1B if they get selected for H-1B uh, oh, without yeah. premium processing. Well, there's no reason to use premium processing for H-1s because they're not gonna be valid until October 1 anyway. And almost all H-1s are approved before October 1. Now, if you get to October 1 and it has not been approved, then you might consider it. However, the filing fee for premium processing is $2,500. That doesn't include the attorney's fees or anything else. So it's a very expensive process right now. Before October 1, you definitely should not do it. After October 1, you just have to make a financial decision if you wanna to try to speed it up. Um, you know, if, if you're gonna get your H-1 approved in a month or so, why spend $2,500 to get it in two weeks? It's just, it's just not worth the money. Of course, you don't really know when it's gonna be approved, which is the problem, um, but that's just a financial decision you, have, you and the company have to make. Um, there's one question about comments on premium processing, which that's, I think we just covered. Um, uh, one question, what kind of ex work experience is acceptable for EB2 with CPT internship and OPT insurance? internship experience count? Yes, it will, as long as it's related to what the job requires. Uh, work in a foreign country uh, can apply also, but remember all of this experience has to meet the exact requirements of the job. So those skill sets, whether there's two or three or 10 of them, that prior experience has to be exactly the same. If it's just in the general area, you can't count it. It has to be identical. Uh, 
do I need to reapply the H1 for location job? Yeah, um, yes, the, if you're working for a company in one uh, position and your H1B is based on that position, if you change the location outside of that metropolitan area, in other words, if you move from one place to another, like from Richardson to Dallas, that doesn't matter. But if you move from Richardson to Oklahoma City, you have to do a new H1. Um, if your job changes substantially, like going from an entry level job to a job that requires two years of experience, you have to do a new H1, even with the same company. And obviously, if you change companies, you have to do a new H1. I see one more uh, private question, which is, can I work remotely from another country while waiting for my H-1B to be released in October? Uh, that's an interesting question, and we see this quite a bit. The easiest way to look at this is U.S. immigration law stops at the border. If you are outside the United States, none of these rules apply to you, not one of them. You can do whatever you want. You can work for a U.S. employer. You can be paid by a U.S. employer. The only time U.S. immigration law applies to you is when you are physically in the U.S. So if you are not here, you can do whatever you want to. The company can do whatever they want to. It's only when you're physically in the United States that you have to follow these rules. Uh, now I've got some more. Uh, can I, whoops. When is the right time to tell the employer about H1 and green card? They are hiring me on OPT. Um, this is kind of a judgment that you have to make. Uh, in some cases, the company will revoke the offer if, offer if they tell, if you tell them you need an H1 and a green card. They'll say, well, we only do OPT, we don't do the H1. Um, then again, uh, you may want to take the the offer on the OPT simply because you need to be working um, so that you don't violate the 90 day rule while you look for another employer that will sponsor you. Um, and as I said before, we've even had situations where the company said, we won't sponsor you for the H1, but we'll let you work on the OPT. And the person did such a great job that they decided to go ahead and sponsor the H1 and the green card. So you never know what's gonna happen. Um, I just think that it's a uh, better policy to tell the employer up front what you need to have so that there's not a misunderstanding and people get very upset later when they find out what's going on. Uh, STEM OPT ends June 2022. And if I apply for H1 in March 2022 and is selected in the lottery, what happened to the gap period between June and October of that year? Um, unfortunately, the cap gap extension for the first year of OPT, I believe, does not apply to the STEM extension. And from June to October 1, it's more than 60 days, so the grace period won't work. So the only way you could actually stay in the United States would be to enroll uh, in a new degree program, start school in August, and then uh, change status to H1 on October 1. Um, I, I would also mention that uh, if you're in the STEM OPT now, uh, you should be applying for registration now uh, for the H1 this year. There's no reason to wait till next year and give up an opportunity to get selected. I do have some additional information about CapGap. Um, so students on STEM OPT are eligible for that. So they are. For, they are. So okay. if, the, if the STEM was ending in June and the employer already filed the H-1B before that, you would be eligible for an extension of both the status and the work authorization through September 30th. Great. Thank you, Sean. That, I was not sure about that. Yeah. Um, so now you know. So if you have that situation where your LPT is going to expire more than 60 days from October 1, you'll get an automatic extension of your status and work authorization. So that's good. Uh, uh, can I work remotely within US due to COVID while in OPT H1? Um, 
the, the answer to the OPT is yes, easily. There's, there's no restrictions on that as long as you make sure that uh, you and the employer notify the international office of a change of address. For the H-1B, it's a little more problematic. Um, if you wanted to be 100% sure, you would just, the company would file a new H-1 to cover the remote site. Uh, my guess, and this is only a guess, is that we're going to get a lot of leniency from the Department of Labor and the Immigration Service on uh, the COVID situation. Uh, but if you wanted to be 100% sure and protect your status, you would have to file a new H-1 to cover both the company's address and also your remote working address, which you can do in one case. Uh, that's all I have, Sean. Yeah, that looks like all of my questions as well. Okay, well, great. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's it. Um, remember everyone, if you have any questions after this evening, you're free to email me and it's a free email. I'll be happy to help you. Just mention that you attended the seminar and you're a student at UTD or a graduate of UTD. I will be more than happy to help you. Uh, there's no charge for that, um, so feel free to do that. Um, good luck to everyone, uh, especially finding jobs these days, uh, although we're improving in that area quite a bit, so hopefully it won't be as bad as it was last year. But good luck with that, good luck with the immigration process, and thank you very much for attending. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to drop a couple of links in the chat for everyone. There were some documents that Mr. Swain's office shared with us. Um, so if we, you know, referenced uh, some documents that you might want to look at. Um, yes. Fact sheets. I have those for you all and our contact information. Right. And there, well is, as, uh, there is a a little handout for employers that summarizes the process we've talked about. And that may be helpful to show to recruiters or companies when you uh, apply for jobs. So do take a look at those, then they might be helpful. Okay. One more, and then as always, if you have questions about your F1 status, that's the part that the ISSO can help you out with. Anything about CPT, OPT, um, feel free to reach out to us on live chat. It's a great way to get an advisor. We do that every day um, or go through your iComet portal. And that's another great way to reach out to us. Yes, take advantage of that while you guys have it. Um, believe me, not all foreign students have access to that kind of assistance, uh, but you do. So take advantage of it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, it looks like we may have gotten a couple additional questions in the chat, let's see. And if we didn't address your question in the chat, um, feel free to post it again. Uh, let's see, you've already provided the email. Uh, is EB2 and EB3 category country specific? And yes, they are. Um, so you have to look at the visa bulletin very carefully uh, to figure out if what quota applies to you. And remember, it's based on birth, not citizenship. So if you became a Canadian citizen, but you were born in China, you're under the China quota. Uh, can we apply for H1 before completing thesis? Yes, you can for a PhD or a master's. Um, and if you wanna work before you complete your thesis, then by all means apply for OPT uh, at least 90 days or 90 days before you uh, want to begin work. Don't wait till the last minute and lose out on a job opportunity. And I think that's it. Right. Um, I see, and do you have time for a couple more questions? I see two more here. Sure. Uh, one question, I think we may have addressed this before. Maybe they want a little extra clarification. Um, they're asking, can we apply for H-1B 
before completing your thesis as a PhD student, or what is the best recommendation before completing your thesis? Well, the H-1 is different than OPT. In order to apply for the H-1, if the job requires a PhD degree, you would have to complete your thesis. Um, some jobs, especially at universities, um, are what's called ABD, all but degree. They only require that, well, actually they require you to complete the courses and the thesis, but you don't have to have your diploma. Uh, so you just need to check with the individual employer and find out what their requirements are. So if they actually require a PhD degree, you would have to complete your thesis. Great. Um, another question is, when can we hear about the results of the lottery? Will I be eligible for the cap gap extension only with the lottery? Uh, the results usually come in before October 1st. Uh, usually within about two months, but there's some cases that take longer for whatever reason. Uh, in some rare situations, it takes longer than October 1. Um, and the bad thing about that situation is the cap gap extension only goes to September 30th. And you, so you couldn't work after that. You can stay in the U.S., but you wouldn't be able to work. And that's when the decision on premium processing becomes important. Um, and the cap gap extension well, only applies to the lot or, well, if you mean it's a cap exempt employer, yes, it still applies. Yeah, and I'll add a little bit about the cap gap here. Um, since they started doing the registration separate from the filing in recent years, um, there's often a lot of confusion about that. And students want to know, can I get the cap cap extension with just that registration receipt before my attorney files? The answer is no. And the day that you file the petition, that the employer files the petition, is going to affect whether you can get cap gap. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. That's a very good point. That the Immigration Service, for some reason, has really limited the cap gap extension. It originally was very generous and very helpful. And they've made it so restrictive now that I'm not sure it's all that great. I guess it does help in some situations, but. They should have left it alone from 2008 when they started it, but they didn't. Yeah. I see another question here. My current company will be applying for my H-1B and I will, and I get another offer from someone who's willing to file or transfer the H-1B as well. When would be my ideal slash earliest date to join the new company so that I can ensure my H-1B is filed this time? Well, you can't transfer the H-1 until you have it. So first of all, your current company would have to get the petition approved and you would have to be working there on October 1st in order to get H-1 status. Then you could file an H-1 transfer, but you can't do it before then because you don't have an H-1 to transfer. So October 1 is the answer to your question. That's the earliest you could do it. And that's assuming that your current company has an approved H-1 petition and you have an approved change of status. Great. Um, I see a couple more questions here. One is how much would it cost to hire an attorney to help with the H-1B process? And can we work with you and your firm? Uh, the second question is yes, you can, um, unless we have a conflict for some reason, which is very rare. Um, the cost, um, I really would prefer to talk about that in an email. If you would email me, I'll be happy to explain it in detail. Um, I will tell you that in general, for most board certified immigration attorneys in North Texas, uh, the cost is going to be an attorney's fees between three and 4,000, somewhere in that range. If, if they say more than that, do not hire them. That is a waste of money. And if they're much lower than that, you have to be careful because they may not know what they're doing. So three to 4,000 is a safe area, um, but there are also a lot of filing fees. The company has that, that $2,000 filing fee they have to pay that you can't pay for them. And then there's about $600 in regular filing fees, which anybody can pay. And if you have dependents, there's another $500 filing fee. Um, we don't charge extra for dependents for attorney's fees. Some attorneys do, so you'll have to find out about that. But if you wanna know our uh, fee schedule, just email me, I'll be happy to give it to you. Great, thank you. 
Um, I see one more here. The question is, you had mentioned about universities offering CPT from day one. In case you enroll into such a program, do you have to complete that course slash program if your H-1B is approved? No, you do not. You can withdraw as soon as your H-1 is approved uh, with the change of status. Um, you do not have to complete it. Um, so uh, you can if you want to. You can certainly continue with it but your status would change to H1. Um, also, there are fewer universities that allow this uh, than universities that will do it. For example, I don't know of any school in Texas that will do it. Not because it's illegal or there's anything wrong with it. It's just a policy decision that schools have made and that's fine. But there are schools that have decided for other reasons that they will do it. So you have to kind of search around I will say one bad thing, or maybe not a great thing about this is that these are graduate programs. And one of the reasons that schools in Texas and good schools outside of Texas won't do it is because they don't want to give a, a spot in the program to somebody who's not even going to be there. So unfortunately, what you're really looking for is graduate programs that aren't all that great. Um, so they have openings. Um, I hate to put it like that, but that's really what's going on is uh the program has not as great a reputation as utd does for example or ut austin or texas a m um, but regardless of whether they have openings or not it's still an approved program and what they're doing is legal and you can get upfront cpt um, but you're also not going to get a degree from harvard either so um, you have to balance all these things Right. It looks like that's all of our questions at this time. And of course, you guys can always right. reach out to us um, through the contact that we shared in the chat. Uh, and if you want to review like this conversation and everything that we talked about, that was a lot of information. It will be up on the YouTube within a week or two. So check back on the UT Dallas YouTube channel if you want to review. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Everyone have a safe evening and uh, email me if you need anything. Thank you again. Okay, thanks John.